I'm going to run through some quick stats. I'm sure you're all aware of it, but I, it, it serves to underline why the government needs to be active on social media. Before it used to be, before we start the slides, before it used to be pretty simple. You had the six o'clock evening news, you had the morning newspapers, and then you had the occasional radio talk show. Today, it's very different. You have 24-hour news channels. You have at least three in this country alone. I'm not even talking about the international news channels. You have uh, the internet, you have radio, you have the, the traditional media, and it's being, uh, that, that space is now being uh, shared with social media. Let me give you some numbers. The number of internet users is estimated to be about 31.6 million Filipinos out of a population of about 95.8 million. That's according to the National Statistics Office. The number of Facebook users, 29.6 million. We rank eight in the world as a country in terms of people on Facebook. And if you do the math, 29.6 over 31.6 million, you're talking about, if these figures are correct, about 90% of people who regularly, of Filipinos who regularly access the internet are on Facebook. I'm not, by the way. <laughs> number of Twitter users, 5.09 million Filipinos. And these numbers are growing every day. Filipinos are ranked third in the highest number of YouTube users in the Asia Pacific region. Number three, Filipinos. And there are almost 95 million mobile phone subscribers in the Philippines as of 2011. That's about 98% of our population. So how can you not be on social media if your job is to communicate what this government is doing. The government has many different messages to send to the public and many different ways in which it does it. But even on the internet, there are different platforms and there are different ways that you need to approach how you disseminate information. So let's start with some of the basics. This is the official gazette. The Official Gazette, which began in 1901, is the publication of all the official utterances of your government, uh, executive orders, uh, court rulings, uh, speeches. This is how it looked in 1906. It was still in Spanish. There was a little bit of innovation in the 1940s. The Official Gazette was in English, but it was still basically the same thing. Later on, and I have something here, this is the Official Gazette from the 1980s. Yeah, we're not supposed to show that slide yet, but anyway. <laughs> this is the official gazette from the 1980s. Again, it's the utterances of the government, court rulings. Like, who cares, right? How many people do you think actually have seen a physical copy of the official gazette? Maybe, well, Maria, because she has to, because her work requires her. Maybe some of us in government, but, you know, it's not exactly the most exciting reading. So what did we do? 2010, we come in, and thanks largely to the efforts of Undersecretary Manolo Quezon, this is the 2012 Official Gazette. It's online. This is the biggest innovation that we've done to the Official Gazette that I'm very proud of. It has, it, you still get the same stuff. The speeches of the president, Executive Order 1500, if you're interested in that, the implementing rules and regulations to the Mining Act, all of that stuff that researchers and media love. But we figured, how do you make this relevant to ordinary people, guys like you? I mean, we're, good, we're putting it online. Just because we put it online doesn't make it more interesting, right? So this is what we did. We put a lot of things. Well, okay, you're still going to see this. The statement of, of Butch Abad on some, state, on some issue. You're going to see this. Next slide. You're going to see the executive order. Next. You're going to see proclamation number 459 and all of that. But you'll also see this. You know how the weather is these days, right? It's, it's kind of bad. I mean, storms cause floods. Everybody's interested in the weather. So what did we do? Pagasa, we told them to go online. Um, we've taken the information from Pagasa. We put it on the official gazette. What do you do when there's a storm? How do you understand those color-coded uh, warnings? It's all there on the official gazette. Practical information that that people need. There's uh, Project NOAA, which goes more in-depth into 
the uh, the weather prediction systems and all of that. So you can actually find out what the weather will be like in your neighborhood uh, by going to Official Gazette. And that helps when there's a lot of rain and you're wondering if there's class the next day or work. Next slide. Here's another thing, another example. Kalasag Nambayan, we're in the earthquake zone. Uh, they call the the zone of fire. Here's practical information that you can find on the Official Gazette. What is an earthquake? What causes it? What do you do when there is an earthquake? This is courtesy of the National uh, Disaster, the NDRRMC, the National Disaster Response. Well, it's so complicated, but you know what it is. <laughs> it's almost as complicated as the name of my office. <laughs> Next. We also include things like this. These are, this is an infographic. It's a quick briefer in graphic form from the Department of Tourism. You want to know how many people go to the Philippines every year? We try to keep this updated. We have it on the official gazette. Next. As part of that DOT briefer, we have information which we hope you'll find useful, such as where do the tourists go when they come to the Philippines? What is the impact on the economy? And uh, where do they come from? All that information from Mon Jimenez, which we put online so that anybody who needs that information can access it. Next. What's this? What's that? Okay. <laughs> Here, this is what we, this is the other thing we've done. It's not just the official gazette that we feel uh, has to go online. There are, there is a use for, for ev almost every department to be online. And so we've encouraged all the departments in the executive to try to see what they can do online to help communicate and serve their, their uh, the customers better. This is a website. This is how the Department of Finance decided it wanted to engage the public online. This is the website called Peranang Bayan. It's a site where you can anonymously tip uh, authorities to tax evaders, smugglers, and other financial criminals. We've had so far about 2,189 referrals. Not all of them have led to cases, but I can tell you that a number of cases filed by Kim Henares and Rufi Biazon uh, have arisen from this website. People would come in, they'd, they'd, they'd give us information, it would be investigated. If there was enough evidence gathered, that would be a case. So we're helping enforce the law. The Department of Finance is helping enforce the law here. The Department of Trade. The Department of Trade is a little bit more ambitious because they need to respond to their clients, which is the business community. They want to be able for businesses to register online without having to go to a DTI office and wait three days. The idea is if you register your business online, you can complete the process in about 15 to 20 minutes. It's a work in progress. Uh, there are other things that the public, that businessmen need to transact with the Department of Trade on. When this is complete, the DTI is hoping that much of the transactions that you do as businessmen with the, with the Department of Trade can be done online, saving everybody a lot of time and money. This is something that's important not just to business people. This is Project NOAA. Project NOAA I mentioned earlier, it helps predict the weather at any given time. It's not yet real time, but it does give you a reasonable uh, idea what your weather is going to be like in the next hour or two hours. This is something that people don't really care about most of the time. But when it rains, I can tell you traffic spikes. It really spikes because we're all worried about whether there's going to be a flood. And this is a sample of what you might find on Project NOAA. Uh, those dots show you the, where the rain is. Depending on the color, it will tell you the level of rainfall can tell you what it is now and what can tell you what it is in the near future. So people really need that kind of information, especially when there's a weather disturbance. Next. There's also YouTube. We gotta be on YouTube, right? We have two YouTube channels, the RTVM channel, which uh, Radio TV Malacanang uploads the videos of the president uh, that they have. They load it up so that the public can see it. You wanna hear the president's State of the Nation address again? Uh, you can access it there. You want to see what the president did yesterday? It, it's there. On the official gazette, we figured, what can we do that's different? We have a YouTube channel as well. We have a, we have a collaboration with Google. You see this video? Uh, we thought this was a message that was best delivered in video rather than infographic form. At the height of the Habagat, uh, there were a lot of donations, and the government had a lot of money to put together relief goods. 
So we had this warehouse. Dinky Soleiman has this warehouse near the near the airport, where they're packing these goods. The goods just came coming in, and they we had policemen, we had soldiers there, but there were just so many goods coming in that we didn't have enough time to pack them. There weren't enough people to pack them. So I went with Dinky. She said, "I need volunteers." So we said, "The fastest way to reach them, without spending a lot of money." I had my guy who's here with us now, Mike Mendoza. He did this video of uh, Dinky. It's not really an overt plea, you know. She just we just walked around uh, the relief center. You saw the goods. Dinky talked about how important it was. We put this up. Forty-eight hours later, eight hundred people showed up, and we were able to pack over a hundred thousand goods uh, and help the people who were affected by the habagat. So you know, different messages. We're really having fun playing around and trying to maximize the potential of social media and we're we're obviously open to suggestions because this is an evolving media but this is what we've been doing so far can i see the next slide and of course there's twitter there is information that the public needs and uh the best examples of how we use twitter to provide them that information is this mmda how many of you guys have are following mmda anybody who drives a car thank you yeah who wants to know what the traffic is like they follow MMDA. The, the other thing about it, what we try to do, and MMDA is doing a good job of it, but they, they're also still a bit undermanned. It's not just them telling you traffic in Buendia, traffic in EDSA. There are people who tweet questions to MMDA, and as much as they can, as quickly as they can, they do answer. Uh, they don't always, they're not always able to answer at the, the time you want, but I think for the most part, people appreciate the effort, and they do get the information when they need it. MMDA has, uh, I can't see the graphic now, but they've got over 100,000 followers. Next. This is what I was talking to you about also. Whenever there's, a traf uh, whenever there's a weather disturbance, these are the guys that you follow on Twitter. Again, if I'm not mistaken, 100,000, 200,000 followers. If there's a storm in Marikina, you're going to hear about it from here. Uh, if you need to evacuate, you're going to hear it from here, or you're going to hear it from the NDRRMC, or you'll hear it from my office, which also has a very active presence on Twitter. Some samples of the uh, tweets that they that they have, and they do this every day. Whether or not there's a storm, uh, whether or not traffic is bad, you're going to get regular updates from them. Next, Facebook. I, I mentioned it earlier. About ninety percent of all of you who are who are active on social media have a Facebook page. So what do we do on Facebook? I mean, just because there's so many people who use Facebook as a medium to reach the internet, we feel we cannot not be on Facebook. So what do we have? We have, I think they call it a mirror site. It's basically what you see on Official Gazette, except it's on Facebook. I, I admit we probably need to think about some other innovations there, because it's pretty much what you see on Official Gazette. And we could probably do a little bit more with that. So if you have ideas later, we'd, we'd appreciate it. This is the Noy Noy Aquino uh, Facebook page. It's interactive. You can go there. This, this began during the campaign, and they decided to keep uh, to keep it up as a means of getting feedback from the public. So you get a lot of feedback on things, uh, like issues. So you, you, we, we actually do have people who read them and process them, so it's not ignored. We may not be able to answer every single one of the, of the comments, but we do go over them and we do process them. That's 2.5 million followers on Facebook. Next. That's the official Gazette fan page on Facebook. So again, it's it's pretty much the same as what we have on, on the regular Official Gazette website. What I notice is this. What people want from the government uh, when they go online is really information. Uh, the MMDA, the, the Pagasa, it's information really more than anything else. The Official Gazette traffic spikes dramatically when they're looking for holiday announcements. <laughs> You're apparently more interested in that than you are in the last speech that I made. <laughs> but yeah, so, so people look to the, in, to the internet for information, and we try to give it to them as much as possible. So let me, let me just make two points. Uh, why is it important, as I said in the beginning? Because there's just so many Filipinos on, on social media that it is impossible for us not to engage on social media. It's a different media from, from traditional media. Most of you are younger. You're normally better educated. And so the approach has to be a little different. 
here's the other thing, though, that I think is very important uh, about social media for government. Because it allows us to reach the public directly without the filter of media. When the president says something and one newspaper or one TV station write it up, they'll write it up. Maybe they're not writing it up in the way we want them to. Or the message that we're trying to convey is not the message that they want to convey. That's what you call the media filter. Social media allows us to reach the public without that filter. You get it straight from us. Let me give you some real concrete information where, where examples where being able to reach the public directly was very important to correct some things that happened. A couple of years ago, Democratic Congresswoman Gabby Giffords was shot in the head by a right-wing nutbag while she was giving a campaign rally. And the initial reports that came out on social media was that she had died. So if you can imagine what her family and her colleagues felt. She didn't die. She actually survived, and she showed up at the Democratic Convention, if you guys saw it. And the quickest way that the news spread was through social media. Unfortunately, it was wrong. And so the Gifford staff people used social media to begin to correct it. They started tweeting the news outlets. They started tweeting people in Congress. Eventually, they got this. Next, a correction from National Public Radio, who first broke the story. Something closer to home. I don't know if you guys saw this. I was at a budget hearing. Frank Dillon was joking about the FOI bill. Somebody wrote it up in a newspaper. These guys picked it up. They attributed it to me. Never said anything. They wrote that story. They tweeted it. Of course, you can imagine the kind of hate mail from the FOI advocates that I got. Can we show them the hate mail? <laughs> there you go. Totally false. So, you know, I could have gone to the papers and I could have said, guys, retract. They would have. In good faith, the newspapers would have come, retracted, corrected themselves. But by then, the damage would have been over. PCIJ has over 100,000 followers. And all of them think that I said that. So what, what was the best thing to do? I went on social media. I used my Twitter account, and I corrected it. And I kept tweeting, and I kept tweeting, and I kept correcting it until I got this. Not that. There. Thank you. So sometimes it is important for us to be online directly because we really do need to filter what comes out. Sometimes you want to listen to us through the filter of the media, and I appreciate and I understand that. But there are also times when you want to hear from us directly. And I think, for me personally, that's why it's important to be on social media. Because aside from the fact that there are so many people and the number is growing, it also allows us a way to communicate without the intermediation of any other third party. And sometimes that is very important. With that, uh, I'm ready for our next speaker or our next question or whatever it may be. Thank you.